Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Telescope Man. Well, this is going to be a little information on me personally and how I got into the hobby. And also maybe some hints on uh, how to go about setting up your ham shack. So I'm going to try, I'm going to, try to do both of those. <clears throat> Now, I know that uh, some of my new subscribers aren't aware of this, but uh, I, I've been a shortwave listener for a long time. I can remember my dad had an a old tube uh, Telefunken uh, shortwave radio, and I would stay up late at night and kind of tune around and listen to the uh, long distance overseas signals coming in. It always interested me. <clears throat> of course, life got in the way. And uh, up until recently, I really had no uh, interest in amateur radio and really no interest in astronomy. When I was a kid, I had a telescope uh, my parents gave me and I used it a lot, but then uh, you know, in my teen years, uh, that kind of went away and never came back till I was much older. Uh, as point of fact, I uh, got both my tech and general license in 2012, both of them. And uh, from that point on, I kind of made it a mission <laughs> to uh, have a very neat ham shack, or as neat as I can design one. I think I, I've succeeded. Um, it's very neatly arranged. There's three operating positions. Let me kind of back up a little bit. Uh, over here is the uh, KWM2 operating position. Uh, I've done a video on that radio. Uh, it's manufactured in 1962. Still works fine. Uh, in the center position is my Flex 3000 software defined radio, <clears throat> kind of modern. And over here on this side, you really can't see it, but uh, I'm not going to move the camera and show you. You can watch some of my previous videos where I showed the shack and, you know, went across and talked about each item. And I'll put a link to that in, in the comments. Uh, but over here, there's my first HF radio, which, which I still have, which is an ICOM 7000. And next to it is a CS800 DMR radio. And next to it is a Uniden uh, BCX15, I believe, scanner. Uh, I've also added, uh, you can see, no, you can't, you can't see it, but I'll give you a link where you can look at it. Up on the top shelf, there's a uh, ALS 600 amplifier. And of course, the Collins has a 30L1 amplifier attached to it. Then on eBay, I kind of found this old Holocrafters uh, S38B. I believe it was made in about 1949. I was lucky enough that there's a fella Oh, gosh, 10 miles away from me, that uh, works on antique radios. And he took that radio and basically rebuilt it and works just fine now. So, uh, and then for fun, on this shelf, actually the camera is sitting on one of the speakers right now, is a uh, 1970s Akai uh, 4000 real to real tape player so <laughs> i've got kind of got a mixture of old and new in the ham shack uh, if you look through some of my previous videos i've had several different desk arrangements uh, my first desk was simply an old computer desk with some shelves above it and i drilled some holes in the back of the shelf to pass the cables through, and that served me for several years, but uh, about a year or so ago, I decided to have a cabinet maker 
come in and actually build me a desk to fit the room exactly. So uh, the desk is about 10 feet long and it's five foot sides and it takes up uh, about half of the room. Um, some unique features of the desk are, you know, you can't move it. It's much, much too heavy to move. You'd have to disassemble it. So what do we do about the cables that are behind this desk? There's dozens of them. Well, when he designed the desk, he designed the panels underneath here, underneath here, all of them, to where you could take them off. You can basically remove them. And then you can get to all the wiring, uh, run new cables, uh, organize cables, do whatever you want to do uh, with the cabling or with the plugs in the wall. I did run uh, 220 to the ham shack before I did this. I uh, actually had an electrician come out and run a separate circuit, uh, 220, comes in that wall back there. And uh, so my amplifier is actually running on 220. I already had a whole bunch of regular plugs in the shack. And, you know, I don't turn on every piece of equipment in here all at one time. So I've never had a problem with the 110 outlets blowing a fuse or anything. Uh, you know, I'll be running at most one of the radios and maybe the scanner or one of the radios and maybe the uh, VHF, UHF uh, uh, listening to some repeaters on the ICOM 7000, something like that, but certainly not exceeding uh, the amps uh, available with a normal uh, modern uh, 110 plug. Anyway, I wanted to give you some hints. Why did I do this at the time I did it? I get that question all the time. And uh, I know a lot of people look at my shack and go, Oh, Lord, have mercy. That boy went crazy. Well, yeah, I guess I did. Uh, uh, back, uh, what is it now, seven or eight years ago, I, uh, my wife has Alzheimer's was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And I knew at some point I would be basically locked up in the house and really couldn't go anywhere if I was taking care of her. So I said, well, maybe now is the time to kind of jump into amateur radio. I was already into amateur astronomy. And, uh, you know, so I decided to jump into amateur radio. And when I did, uh, basically uh, started very small uh, with just a uh, VHF, UHF uh, radio and uh, the ICOM 7000 used. I bought it used. Uh, that was actually my first equipment. And I used that for a while before I started splurging on all the other equipment. Anyway, now that you know a little bit about my history, uh, let me kind of uh, make a little list of things that might help you when you set up your ham shack. So you don't make the same mistakes I did. And I made all of them uh, before I got this shack set up the way I wanted it. So let me kind of read some of these to you and kind of discuss them. When you set up your shack, Set it up as if you are going to go full bore with everything. In other words, your intention is to have three radios and uh, four antennas and uh, an amplifier. You're going to go hog wild. If you will set up your shack in that fashion, uh, you won't have any problems as you add equipment. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> One of the thir first things you might consider doing is make sure you have enough plugs in the wall uh, wherever you need them. So that would be number one. 110 plugs have quite a few of them. Then you might want to consider putting in a 220 line 
before you do anything, uh, you got free access to all the walls. You can put it where you think it might be best uh, and have that run to the shack, even though you may not need it at this time. Also, you will want to get the absolute best coax you can afford. Don't go out there and buy RG58 coax. Please don't do that. You know, that's some of the worst stuff out there. I don't care who makes it. Uh, if you watch some of my other videos, you know I recommend RG213 for HF and LMR400 for uh, VHF, UHF. If you'll stick with those two, on down the road you won't have any problems running an amp or doing whatever you want to do. Those two kind of coax, types of coax will work with whatever you decide to put in the shack. So when you start, set up the shack like you're going to go crazy. That's my advice. And number two, find you a desk that has some kind of a shelf on it. It could be like my first desk, was simply a desk with a shelf that I found that was uh, could be set on top of the desk, and that gave me a little elevation where I could put equi other equipment. So, uh, and the other good thing about it was that particular desk had a front on it underneath, so all the wiring was hidden behind the uh, kick plate of the desk. You couldn't see it when you walked in the room. Uh, <clears throat> so I kind of get a kick out of some of the hams I see. You rock, you, they show pictures of their ham shack, and it looks like somebody threw spaghetti against the wall, and it fell wherever it wanted to fall. Um, you know, not only is that could be dangerous to have all those wires misrun in every direction you could think of where people can trip over them or snag them or whatever, uh, but it could cause you some interference. Uh, if you run certain wires in parallel with certain other wires uh, and your coax is not up to snuff, you may have some uh, interference between the two coaxes. Or if you run a, a high-powered uh, 220 line right next to your transmission line or, or say, bundle together with it, I don't know how you do that, but you can imagine bundling a, a 220 uh, a line, a mains line, with your coax with some zip ties you know, you're going to get some uh, power line noise transfer there. So uh, having a spaghetti type ham shack is not good. You need to organize the coax uh, where it's safely arranged behind the desk and where you kind of know where everything runs to. So if you have a problem, you can uh, uh, troubleshoot it. So get a desk with a shelf. Get a desk with a shelf. And what should the space be? Well, this is 10 inches. What you're looking at here is 10 inches. 8 to 10 inches would work just fine. You can stack something on top of something else, possibly, you know, with 8 to 10 inches. If this was 8 inches, it would be about right there, you know, pretty much. And I could still get these two pieces of equipment. Uh, underneath the shelf. Uh, so 8 to 10 inches high above the shelf is what you want. Uh, <clears throat> All right, now where do you put your equipment? Well, I'm right-handed. Okay, I'm right-handed. So, one of the pieces of equipment that I use a lot is the antenna tuner right here. So, I want it where I can just reach it and tune the antenna if I need to, okay? My flex, all my controls from my flex are operated with this mouse under here. And again, right-handed, 
and I can work the flex radio on the uh, computer under the desk using this mouse. So uh, the amplifier, on, in other words, is on the second shelf. The only time I need to touch that amplifier is when I change bands. And then all I have to do is flick a switch to a new band. And uh, I can easily reach that, again, from this position. So I've got my hand on the knob right now. So that's not a problem. So everything I need to operate is within reach of my right hand because I'm right-handed. Now, if I was left-handed, I would probably put this tuner on the other side, okay? It'd be on the other side so I could operate it with my left hand, and the mouse, of course, would be on the other side of the desk. So anyway, think about that when you set up your desk. You know, your power supply uh, needs a lot of ventilation, so probably a good place for it is on the top shelf. My amplifier is on the top shelf. It needs good ventilation, okay? So it's on the top shelf. So think about those things when uh, you set up your shack and be sure you get a desk with a shelf on it. Plan in advance to have two or three antennas. Yes, I know, you just got in the hobby, and you went out there and bought a mobile radio and a power supply, and you put that on the desk, and now you're figuring out, uh, you know, how you're going to get that one coax into the building. Well, stop right there and think about what you're going to do with the next piece of coax. Um, in my case, I set up by a window. I have a standard uh, MFJ pass-through panel with a series of uh, pass-through connections. So uh, I can have up to five PL259 connectors and one uh, balanced line connector, ladder line connector, uh, without cutting any holes in the building. So think about that. <coughs> When you go to set up your first antenna outside, is this going to be my last antenna? Well, I can bet you money if you stick with the hobby, it will not be your last antenna. So plan on having two or three antennas. For example, my scanner has its own antenna. All right, its own coax. So uh, I could run it off of my dual band antenna that my ICOM is plugged into and my, um, and my uh, CS800 is plugged into. But <clears throat> it's always better to have them on separate antennas because then you don't have to throw switches. You don't have to have a switch. Uh, the coax just simply goes to another antenna. That works really well to, uh, you know, in HF operations where you may have a beam up in the air on a tower and it's got a piece of coax coming in and then you might have a wire or a loop antenna or something on the property like that or a dipole and it's got cable coming in. So uh, then you have a VHF, UHF antenna and there's three entrances. You're going to have to have three pieces of coax coming in the building. So think about that <clears throat> when you do the first antenna. Don't just plan for the first. Plan for two or three antennas. You, you won't be frustrated later. You know, I've, I've heard of people cutting holes in building or drilling through a building that just enough to run a piece of coax in, and then they discover they need two more pieces of coax. Uh, anyway, don't do that. If you have coax running across the property up in the air, it's not going underground, you didn't dig a trench and bury it, you ran it above, run a messenger line, a messenger line first. 
And in my case, uh, I have a messenger line. I went to a hardware store, bought little stainless steel clothesline wire and a couple of turnbuckles. And the first thing I put up was a messenger line between the work shed in the backyard and the house. And I ran that wire <coughs> tautly between those two structures. Then when I had to run my coax, I simply zip tied it uh, many times along the messenger line. And the messenger line supports the weight of the coax. There's no droop in it. Uh, you know, you're not going to pull connections loose or anything like that. So run a messenger line first. Uh, if you're going to run coax uh, above the ground, you know, above, you know, get it up there where you don't have to worry about it if you're cutting the grass or anything, and it's basically up and out of the way. That would be some advice for you, if you have that kind of a situation. Boy, this is, uh, the next one is kind of a up for discussion, up for comments. My equipment is all ground to a single point ground and I have a uh, ground rod, 10 foot ground rod, right outside that window, not four feet away from the equipment. And uh, until I did that and actually uh, grounded everything to a single point ground, I had a lot of RF, RFI radio frequency interference, <clears throat> if you're a newbie and don't know what RFI is, uh, I had a lot of that inside the shack, okay? And uh, what would happen on 40 meters was I'd key up and the computer USB ports would all drop out. And I'd have to reboot the computer to connect them again. Uh, anyway, the moment I installed a single point ground to the equipment, all the equipment running, the grounds weren't running to one point, and then that point running directly out into a uh, ground rod, I had no more RFI in the shack ever again. So uh, I'm a proponent of grounding. Now, there's a lot of hams that don't ground their equipment at all. If you're on the second floor uh, and your equipment is ungrounded, I would encourage you to have what they call the balanced antenna. You probably don't want to run a long wire antenna to a second floor ham shack that doesn't have any grounds in it, grounding. Uh, you're going to get a lot of uh, current coming back down the coax and coming in the shack and interfering with the audio maybe or interfering uh, with the TV or <laughs> interfering with the uh, computer that's in the, inside the shack. So you probably need to uh, pay, if you're on the second floor and you don't have a ground or ground is too impractical, then I would say to always use a balanced antenna with a ballon. Uh, <clears throat> that'll prevent any common mode currents from running down the coax. Uh, and get that antenna away from your operating position a little bit. If it's right outside the window, uh, whether it's balanced or not, it's not going to do you any good. It's got to be away from you a ways. Let's just say a half a wavelength on whatever frequency you're trying to operate. Get it away. Mine is, uh, oh, let's see, probably 35 feet away from me. Any of the wires are 35 feet or more away from me in the yard. So uh, keep that in mind if you do not have a ground or you can't ground because of uh, where the radio happens to be. <clears throat> and finally, uh, think about lightning. 
and not necessarily thinking about um, a direct strike. If you have a direct strike, uh, all bets are off. There's no telling what's going to happen. Uh, all the lightning protection in the world may not protect you from a direct strike. Okay, that lightning's going to go wherever that lightning wants to go. Remember, it just traveled across several miles of clear air to reach your house. And if you think uh, a ground strap is going to stop it from going uh, that's about this wide, is going to stop it from going wherever it feels like going, well, you're in for a big surprise. So let's, let's throw out the direct strike. Direct strike is bad. You're going to lose some equipment. Uh, if you're lucky, you'll only lose the antenna. <clears throat> anyway, what I'm talking about is near strikes. Near strikes. It hits the tree in your neighbor's yard. Doesn't hit your equipment. However, uh, the electromagnetic radiation hits your equipment. And that creates voltage in the lines and could be hundreds of volts in the lines. That's where you need the lightning protection device. I've got all my equipment uh, lightning protected using uh, regular Alpha Delta lightning protectors. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't really taken any close-in strikes or if I have and I have a discharge that I didn't know anything about, I wouldn't know about it. Uh, but I've never had to replace the little uh, lightning arrestor plugs. None of them have failed yet, but that doesn't mean that I haven't had a nearby strike that activated that and sent it to ground rather than to my equipment. However, the main protection I rely on is I unplug everything when there's a thunderstorm. So I have installed quick disconnect connectors for all the coax that's inside the shack. So I can, in a matter of 15 seconds, I can unplug all the coax coming in from outside from any equipment. All right. <clears throat> That's probably your best safety precaution I can give you for lightning protection. If you do take a direct strike and the lightning comes in the building, uh, yeah, it's going to, I don't know. I don't know if it would come in the building because it's going to go through a lightning protector first. It's got to travel down that coax, you know, go through that lightning protector, then it's going to have to go through the ground that's uh, on the panel, pass-through panel. The shields on, the, on all the co coax is grounded to the panel, and that panel is two feet away from that ground rod, and a copper strap runs from the panel to the ground rod. So it would, that voltage would have to get through all those protections now. Yeah, it could, but once it got inside, I don't believe it would be, you know, thousands and thousands of volts. Could be a thousand volts, two thousand volts, or something like that. But I think by the time it passed through several layers of protection, that the voltage would have dropped some. And uh, the coax does run along the ground for a period of time before it even reaches the lightning protectors. So, uh, you know, if a huge current came down, more than likely it would short circuit into the ground as the coax was running along the ground. Uh, don't know. I've never had a direct strike and hope I never do. Uh, that's why I have insurance on the equipment just in case, but I do unplug everything anytime there's a thunderstorm and I move 
to my emergency station in the garage which is on battery backup and which has an antenna inside the attic inside the attic so yeah I'm running that with antennas inside the attic yes uh, they could take a strike a nearby strike maybe but again it's inside the attic I don't know uh, never had that problem yet and I do run it during thunderstorms uh, especially when there's a weather net on so I'm running it during the worst kind of weather that you can imagine with lightning hitting all around me so uh, nothing has happened yet anyway uh, that's my last recommendation to you so uh, anyway look around the shack yes it's taken me several years to do this I'm really happy with the shack the way it is now basically works perfectly um, if you don't know I have a beam up about 40 feet uh, in the backyard and I'm running a 127 foot uh, in fed uh, piece of uh, co a piece of wire uh, for the odd bands for the odd bands that the uh, beam does not work on so that's my HF setup and uh, for my VHF setup I've got a Comet GP9 vertical that's up about 25 feet above the ground and uh, of course it's a 17 foot vertical so the top of it is up there around 40 feet so I'm very happy with the shack and I uh, hope this gave you a little bit more insight into telescope man how he got in the hobby uh, what his interests are obviously I like old tapes from the 60s and 70s that I can play on this Akai uh, DS4000 that I'm looking at right here and uh, I like old equipment you see some of the old equipment back here I like to operate that <laughs> But I really like to operate the digital modes. That's, uh, I do some single sideband voice whenever some DX is coming in, uh, of course. But uh, generally, you'll find me on one of the digital modes, PSK31, FT8, JT65, RTTY, one of those. I uh, might even be decoding a little uh, Morse code, CW. Made a few contacts, uh, basically decoding and transmitting CW using the computer. So, uh, have done that. So, but digital mode is my kind of uh, peculiar, uh, peculiar thing in the hobby that I like. With that said, I sorry the video went so long. Hope you gave, gave you a better idea who I am and uh, a little bit about me and how I got into the hobby. And as I usually do, I wish you clear skies in 73. And remember to keep looking up to see the greatest show on earth right over your head every single night. Y'all be good. See y'all later.